This video is sponsored by Novium, creating innovative hover pens inspired by space to stimulate curiosity. Back in action. Starship 29 test campaign is already coming to an end. What now? How will SpaceX solve the issues from Flight 3? The end of the Delta rockets is here, and an unexpected duo is working on a brand new rocket. My name is Felix, welcome to What About It, let's dive right in. Starship updates. The fourth flight of Starship is coming. SpaceX's engineers are ticking off the remaining boxes, and the pace seems to be only accelerating. But can they solve the issues of Flight 3? How will they do that? Want to find out? Follow me. The ground at the gateway to Mars has once again rumbled. While it wasn't a launch that shook the facility this time, it was still crucial to Starship's success. Just two weeks have passed since the launch of the third Starship, which showcased that this crazy design may actually work. And now another ship has made its way to the launch site. This time it is Ship 29, which is extremely similar to its predecessor. Based on the announced road closures, we were gearing up for a static fire test of this prototype, potentially as soon as March 25th. And indeed, the day turned out to be quite eventful. It kicked off with the usual, the Sheriff closing off part of Highway 4 for safety measures. Soon after, the suborbital tank farm sprung into action, and the prototype's tanks began to fill with liquid oxygen and liquid methane. Given that a static fire is a brief test lasting only a few seconds, the vehicle wasn't fully fueled, which is why the frost line covered only a portion of the tanks. After an hour of fueling, everything was ready and all six Raptor engines roared to life, allowing us to film some insane views. The test was a complete success, however having the prototype anchored to the stand during testing has its drawbacks. A significant number of heat tiles are either damaged or completely missing after each static fire. And this time it was no exception. The tile loss comes mostly from vibrations from the pad transferring to the vehicle, coupled with shock waves bouncing off the ground. From the photos captured by our photographer John, it is clear that this test didn't go easy on Ship 29. A significant number of tiles, especially around the aft section, are missing. Naturally, these tiles will have to be replaced. One concerning fact is that a few missing tiles could be the deciding factor between the ship successfully surviving re-entry and meeting its demise in a rapid, unscheduled disassembly. 18,000 tiles and rapid reusability are certainly an interesting mix. On the other hand, SpaceX already proved that they can replace these guys in a matter of minutes, unlike with the Space Shuttle, where replacing a single tile could take as long as three days. What are your thoughts? Do you believe SpaceX will solve the tile problem in future missions, or will they need to explore alternative solutions? How would you improve this? Share your opinions in the comments. Despite the loss of the heat tiles, SpaceX confirmed that the test was a complete success and that it indeed used six Raptor engines. With this milestone achieved, the next and potentially final item on Ship 29's pre-flight checklist is a single engine static fire. This test aims to simulate a Raptor reignition in space, a critical maneuver required to deorbit. Ship 28 was initially supposed to perform this test, but it was ultimately skipped due to roll issues. An alert notice for residents of Boca Chica Village was issued on March 27th, aligning with a road closure scheduled for the same day. If the test occurred before the release of this video, you should be seeing footage of it on your screen right now. Following a successful test campaign, Ship 29 is expected to return to either the high bay or the second mega bay for final touches and modifications. If there will be any changes, they will likely aim to address the issues observed during the third flight, where the ship was uncontrollably spinning along its roll axis while in space. Initially, it seemed this might have been an intentional maneuver related to fuel transfer or payload bay opening. However, as re-entry approached, it became apparent that there was a problem. The exact cause remains unclear, but it's highly probable that a vent or cold gas thruster intended to counteract the spin froze over. This is also a perfect moment to delve into how Starship maneuvers and controls its orientation in space. Attitude control can be achieved through what is known as Reaction Control Systems, or RCS for short, but what exactly is that? RCS thrusters are compact devices that produce thrust. 
By strategically placing a sufficient number of these thrusters around the spacecraft, it is possible to manipulate its rotation along any axis. There is no counteracting force in space, no air resistance and no acting gravity in orbit as it is countered by the orbital velocity, so you can't deploy flaps or use a rudder. Usually, spacecraft are equipped with a type of RCS we call cold gas thrusters. The term cold here implies that the system operates without combustion. So the temperature of the gas used doesn't matter. Even with hot gas, it would technically be a cold gas thruster if there is no combustion involved. The working principle behind cold gas thrusters is surprisingly straightforward. Essentially, the vehicle carries a tank filled with pressurized gas, commonly nitrogen, though helium and argon are also used. This tank is linked to a valve, which when opened allows the pressurized gas to escape through a nozzle. The action of releasing the gas generates thrust, propelling the spacecraft in the direction opposite to the exhaust. That's what we call Newton's third law of motion. While I do get that this principle is not very intuitive, flat earthers really don't like this one. This system is cost effective and relatively simple to implement, but it's not without its drawbacks. The thrust produced is tiny, and the requirement for additional tanks adds to the spacecraft's overall weight. Falcon 9 uses such thrusters, and Starship prototypes up to SN15 did as well. However, newer Starship prototypes have adopted a slightly different approach to make use of cryogenic fuel's tendency to boil off, catching two birds with one stone. Poor birds. Within the tanks, the liquid absorbs external heat, warming up and transitioning from liquid to gas. This creates a pretty big issue, bird number one. As the gas expands, it increases pressure within the tank. To prevent the tanks from bursting, this built-up gas needs to be vented. To deal with this build-up, Starship is equipped with an array of vents for both methane and oxygen tanks, as well as the header tanks. This is where SpaceX's engineers had a brilliant idea. What if, instead of merely releasing it, the gas could be repurposed to function as the RCS, bird number two? Changing a vent into a thruster is as simple as attaching the right nozzle to it. This idea led to the introduction of the cowbell-shaped nozzles we can now find on Starship. Initially, these modified vents were intended for the booster only, with the Starship using a hot gas thruster system. However, during a fantastic interview conducted by Tim Dodd, he asked if allergy gas thrusters are for super heavy only. But this is only for the booster, right? Yes. Um... Although arguably, now that you mention it, we, sh we, sh we, might, we might, might be wise to do this for the ship too. After which Elon Musk had a eureka moment, where he realized that the same method could be used for the ship. This system, while incredibly efficient, isn't perfect either. For starters, such thrusters depend on having excess heated fuel in the tanks, a factor that complicates mission planning. As tank pressure increases, so too does the thrust from the thrusters, making it difficult to predict the system's behavior. Additionally, it poses a risk of vent freezing, which is what likely caused numerous issues during the most recent mission. Oxygen and methane both love freezing in space. So what could SpaceX do to address these issues in their next prototype? One straightforward solution could involve adding more vents to introduce redundancy. Whether this adjustment can be integrated into existing prototypes remains to be seen. Another possibility could be a return to the concept of hot gas thrusters. Unlike cold gas RCS, hot gas thrusters are miniature rocket engines, where gaseous fuel and oxidizer are combined and ignited. This method, while more complex, could offer a more reliable and controllable alternative to the existing system. Since Starship needs to vent heated fuel anyway, it makes sense to utilize it to generate thrust more efficiently. And it's more than just me throwing ideas at the wall. The hot gas thruster concept had progressed to a point where we saw one installed atop Super Heavy BN3. Yet, this approach was dropped in favor of the Alich vent thrusters. Technically, SpaceX could still revisit hot gas thrusters, though this would likely necessitate substantial modifications to the prototypes. Beyond hot gas, there is a plethora of other options such as chemical thrusters. These systems induce a chemical reaction with a catalyst to generate gas and consequently thrust. Another theoretically viable but impractical option for Starship could be the addition of vernier thrusters. These medium-scale rocket engines offer significantly more thrust than their cold gas counterparts and are utilized in rockets like Soyuz. 
However, adding a vernier thruster into a Starship would require a complete overhaul of the vehicle's plumbing, not to mention the development of a Mini Raptor. There is likely no way they'll do that, but at least now you know what a vernier thruster is. Ultimately, the decision likely narrows down to using either Olich gas, dedicated cold gas or hot gas thrusters. In my opinion, SpaceX will have already solved the issues found during Flight 3, making the reintroduction of hot gas thrusters for Starship unlikely. However, one variant that will incorporate Methalox thrusters is the Starship Human Landing System. In the final moments of its lunar descent, rather than relying on the Raptor engines which would kick up a storm of lunar dust, the lunar Starship will use a ring of Methalox thrusters to gently touch down. What are your thoughts on the issues surrounding Starship's RCS? Do you see it as a potential showstopper or just a minor technical hurdle to overcome? Please let me know in the comments. Now you've watched more than half the video and you're still watching, thank you, this means you like it. We've looked into our channel metrics and there are over 2 million returning monthly viewers who have not subscribed yet. Help us improve the channel even further by double checking that you've hit that subscribe button so you don't miss our updates. While you're at it, give us a like and become a Y supporter for exclusive SpaceX updates. With it, you get access to daily Starbase photo galleries, including satellite, aerial and ground photos of SpaceX's progress and countless other extras on top. And no matter how much you decide to give, everyone gets the same supporter content and access you decide what you want to give. For all of those who watched IFT3 with us or somewhere else, I have something very special. So brand new that I don't even have my shirt yet. Oh, wait, I do! Our IFT3 commemorative shirt. If you loved IFT3, this is something you want to have. The shirt is tagged in the video and the link to our Patreon page and our new website is in the description. Thanks to all the supporters who help us fund more crazy projects. We can't thank you enough. You rock. Now before we continue with the news, here is a word about gravity defying pens from our sponsor. At what about it, curiosity and creativity propel us, and today's sponsor, Novium, fuels our inspiration. Novium crafts high-end, unique products aimed to inspire. Their refillable hover pens are an original and timeless combination of space and art. Perfect gifts for yourself and loved ones. I often fidget with my Time Award-winning Interstellar hover pen for ideas. Look at this. Ooh. <laughs> It floats at a 23.5 degree angle like Earth's tilt. Available in four colors, it offers both a sleek look and a premium writing experience. Did you catch my secret message? Impressed with the premium edition, featuring 18 karat gold plating and a genuine meteorite shard 20 million years older than Earth. For functionality, consider the Future Edition Hover Pen, a 2-in-1 fountain and rollerball hover pen with interchangeable tips. Try them yourself, use the link in the description and get 10% off on all hover pens with code WAI and free international shipping to most countries. Going back to the news, we need to mention an event that will mark the end of an era. Let me tell you about the amazing journey of the Delta Rocket family. The Delta rocket family boasts a long and rich legacy, stretching back to the dawn of space exploration. It all began with the Thor missile, the Air Force's first operational ballistic rocket designed as a weapon against Russia during the Cold War. However, it wasn't long before engineers realized that the technology could serve a more peaceful purpose by launching payloads into space. After experimenting with four different upper stages, they settled on the Thor Delta configuration, naming it after the fourth letter of the Greek alphabet. Despite an initial launch failure in the 1960s, the Thor Delta successfully completed 11 missions. Subsequently, it underwent a series of upgrades, evolving from Delta A through to Delta N in a relatively short span of time. Delta One concluded its service in 1990, but by then the United States was already witnessing the rise of the legendary Delta II. This new iteration was not only more powerful than its predecessor, but also boasted an impressive track record of reliability with only one complete failure out of 155 missions. However, it is important to note that when this one failure occurred, it was nothing short of dramatic. On January 17th, during a mission carrying the GPS-2R1 satellite, a malfunction in the solid rocket booster led to a catastrophic explosion just 13 seconds post-liftoff. 
Burning rocket fuel rained down everywhere, causing destruction over a wide area. Over 20 vehicles were destroyed and windows were shattered up to 16 kilometers or 10 miles away from the launch site. Yet, despite this one setback, Delta II went on to launch some of the most iconic missions, including the Mars Pathfinder and the Spirit and Opportunity rovers before being retired in 2018. There was also the Delta III optimized for geostationary transfer orbit launches. It experienced a brief but troubled lifespan, with all three of its missions ending in failure or partial failure. Then, in 2002, the space industry was introduced to a game changer, the Delta IV rocket. The vehicle itself was deployed mostly for national security launches. Despite its name, Delta IV itself didn't have that much heritage from previous Deltas. The most significant change was the switch from kerosene to liquid hydrogen, which required not only new engines, but new tanks as well. With a complete redesign, Boeing took the time to create what's known as the Common Booster Core, which was a highly modular rocket's first stage. At that point, Boeing was at the height of its game. This very invention allowed Delta to split into two lines. The first one, Delta IV Medium, had four configurations of fairings and rocket boosters. In its most capable version, it could bring almost 13,000 kilograms or 28,000 pounds of cargo to LEO. It launched a total of 29 times, all of which were absolutely successful. However, the more recognizable variant of this rocket is likely the Delta IV Heavy. It's made up of three common booster cores, creating one massive rocket. Since its inaugural flight in 2004, the Delta IV Heavy has carried out missions of both classified nature and significant scientific interest, including launching the Orion test capsule and the Parker Solar Probe. With the formation of United Launch Alliance in 2006, the focus expanded beyond just launching Deltas to developing the next generation launch vehicle, the Vulcan Centaur. This transition began the gradual phasing out of the Delta family, with the Delta IV Medium marking its final voyage in 2019, leaving the heavy variant as the last in the Delta family. The last mission assigned to this iconic launcher is NROL-70, another secretive mission for the National Reconnaissance Office. Although the specifics of the payload are cloaked in secrecy, it is likely yet another spy satellite. The final launch was scheduled for March 28th. By the time you're watching this, it might have already launched, marking a historical moment as we witness the retirement of a rocket family that has played a crucial role in launching so many missions. Farewell, Delta! With the retirement of the Delta, ULA plans to hand Space Launch Complex 37 back to the Space Force. This in return opens up an exciting opportunity for SpaceX, which has expressed a lot of interest in acquiring the site. An environmental review is already in progress. Elon Musk's company wants to build another Starship launch and catch tower at this location. Now while some rockets retire, new ones are popping up left and right. If you're a regular viewer of What About It, you're probably familiar with Firefly Aerospace a small space company responsible for the development of the Alpha rocket. The journey of this small satellite launcher has been fraught with challenges. Alpha's maiden voyage ended dramatically with the rocket being destroyed shortly after takeoff. The second launch managed to reach orbit, but not the intended one, resulting in the satellites burning up in the atmosphere a week later. Finally, Firefly achieved a significant milestone with the Victus Knox mission in September 2023. They successfully executed a responsive launch that went from payload integration to liftoff in just 27 hours. Despite this success, Firefly's latest mission also ended up being a partial failure. Nevertheless, the company has caught the attention of Northrop Grumman which has chosen them to develop a new first stage for its Antares rocket. The newest version, Antares 230 Plus, utilizes a first stage composed of components sourced from Russia and Ukraine, a supply chain disrupted by the Russian war efforts. The upcoming Antares 300's first stage will not only be taller than its predecessor, but it will also shift from two RD-181 engines to seven Miranda engines. These run on RP-1 and liquid oxygen and are already being tested at Firefly's facility. Interestingly, Antares 300 will use the upper stage from its predecessor, which is actually quite a genius move. Maiden launches often fail due to second stage issues, but by reusing the proven design, they could achieve a successful orbit on their inaugural attempt. The first launch of Antares 300 is scheduled for 2025. 
However, their partnership seems to be extending beyond just a single launch vehicle. Firefly and Northrop Grumman are already working on an unnamed medium launch vehicle, which will bring the Antares family to a new level. This future vehicle will reuse the Antares 300 booster, coupled with a brand new upper stage from Firefly. This will enhance its payload capacity to over 16,000 kilograms or 35,000 pounds to low Earth orbit. This would effectively double the current Antares' lifting capability. The MLV will be manufactured mostly of carbon fiber. Firefly has even already produced the first prototype tanks testing their automated fiber placement machine. We don't see this collaboration between new space and old space companies very often, so I am interested to see if they'll be able to achieve success. That's it for today. Remember to smash that like button, subscribe for more awesome content. This is what fuels the algorithm and helps us immensely. Check out our epic shirts in your favorite Space Nerd store. A link is in the description. And if you want to train your space IQ even further, watch this video next to continue your journey. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you again in the next episode. Starship 29 Kest Campaign and in the and in DD. Been an intentional intention and a little. It was no exception. <laughs>